you know, the real wealth at the moment is being made by people who know how to develop business assets. So I'm going to give you a model called 24 assets. And 24 assets is the model that I use to make businesses valuable and scalable. So first rule is income follows assets, right? So if you want more income, you need more assets. If you want rental income, first you need a house. If you want dividend income, first you need shares that pay dividends. Uh, if you want to have better marketing campaigns, you need marketing campaign assets. If you want to have investor funds, you need investor fund creation assets. Uh, if you want to charge a premium price, you need assets like awards um, and uh, anything that shows that you're a premium provider. So income follows assets. First the asset, then the income. Um, let's have a look at this as a thought experiment. Imagine for a moment that you inherit this building. It's in Mayfair in London. And I know that this building rents for about a million pounds a month. So it's 12 million pounds a year. If you owned this building, which is a whopping big asset, how many people do you need in order to make 12 million a year? You actually need one or two people, right, to manage that, maybe three or four tops. So you can probably get, let's say you need a, a, a three-person team. So for every person on your team, you're getting four million pounds worth of income. So because you own a big asset, a three-person team generates 12 million pounds. So now you only need three people to generate 12 million. So it's four million per person. So the bigger the asset, the more revenue per person you're going to get, right? If you're renting the same building out in Liverpool, you're probably going to rent it out for a fraction of that. And the same three-person team is going to be required to manage that building. So now you're only getting hundreds of thousands per person. So essentially, yeah, the bigger the asset, the more valuable the assets that you're working with, the more well-developed the assets, the higher the revenue per person. So here's an interesting part about this thought experiment. When most people look at this building here, they see one thing. They say, this is one thing called a building. But if an expert, a property expert looks at this, they don't see one thing. They see multiple things. They say, well, this building has different systems. It's got a foundation. It's got a roofing system. It's got an electrical system. It's got a plumbing system. It's got an interior. It's got a security system. There are all sorts of things that are sitting on top of each other in order to make this work. Now, when I look at a business, I see multiple systems sitting on top of each other. I see intellectual property and brand and market and products and systems and culture and funding assets. And I go, oh, there you go. There's all the things that are sitting on top of each other. That's the building, right? So I don't see one thing when I see a business. I see 24 things that fit across seven categories. So we'll go through those. So an asset what is a business asset? An asset is anything that produces value if you're not around. So if you, were, if you were on an island without your phone and your laptop, an asset is anything that still produces value within your business when you're not around or when nobody's around. Right. So if we completely replace your team, if I pull you and your team out of the business, all that's left is the assets. So for example, if you've got a website that generates 10 leads a day, that's a pretty good asset. Um, if you've got an entire bank of uh, SEO blogs and those blogs generate 40,000 hits to the website every month, those blogs are pretty good assets. If you've got some automated systems that just deliver value, let's say you've got created a portal and your customers just log into the portal and get value, doesn't matter where you are in the world, that's a pretty good asset. So anything that's creating value when you're not in the room is an asset, right? That's what we, that's what we think of as an asset. So why is that Mayfair building so valuable? It generates value regardless of where the Duke of Westminster is, right? The Duke of Westminster can be anywhere in the world and the building still delivers value. It still adds value to the tenant. So therefore, it's an asset. doesn't matter where you are, the asset's doing the work. It's, it's generating the value. Um, so assets are not tools. Tools are things that other companies have created. Other companies create tools for you to use Assets are things that you've created, right? So you, a tool is not an asset. I don't want to hear that you say, oh, I've got great assets because I've got a Stripe account and I've got Dropbox, you know, that we use as a system. And I've got, you know, I'm using, I'm an Amazon dropshipper. That's not your asset. Your assets are the things that you own, that you created, right? So you've got to create your own assets.
So we talked about scale is revenue per person times the number of people, right? Scale is not revenue per person. It's assets times people, right? So the more assets and the more people, the more scale. So more assets, more people equals more scale. So let's talk about 24 assets. So the 24 assets, I want you to be thinking about all of these in terms of really simple. When we look at these assets, I want you to think, am I struggling in this area? Am I getting by or am I really proud of this? So each asset that I'm going to talk about will say, is this of licensable quality? Would other people license this? Or do we have something, but it's not that impressive? Or are we really struggling? This is causing a bottleneck or we're completely reliant on an individual or supplier. It causes confusion. It prevents us from scaling, right? So this is what we're looking for here. Okay, let's go through the 24 assets. Get your pen and papers out because this is going to go quick and we're going to cover a lot, right? In a fast, fast pace. Okay, so the base layer of assets is called intellectual property. Intellectual property is made up of three categories of assets. There's registered intellectual property where you register a patent or a trademark. There's a content library where you produce stuff and you put it out there in public domain or you've created content and there's your unique methodologies. So for example, uh, I've got the registered asset called 24 assets. If you launch something called 24 assets, you'll be in breach of my registered trademark. We've registered the name Dent. We've registered the name Key Person of Influence. So we have registered trademarks, registered assets. We also have created methodologies. Our methodologies like the pitching methodologies called Capstone. We've created a methodology around campaigning. We've also created lots of content. There's books that I've launched, right? So there's se several books in the series. That's all content. There's videos on YouTube. That's content. There's podcasts that you can listen to. That's all content. So what we have here is method, content, and registered IP. So these are the three things that make up the intellectual property layer of your business. So I want you to give yourself a little bit of a score. Do you have registered IP? Do you have content? Do you have methodologies that are truly uniquely your own? Um, those are the three things at the base layer. Our next layer on top of intellectual property is our brand. <clears throat> so our brand is made up of our philosophy, our identity and the ambassadors who represent us. So if we go to Nike, uh, if we take a look at Nike, we already know that Serena Williams is an ambassador. Um, there is a brand identity where we can instantly recognize the Nike swoosh. And there's philosophy like just do it, right? So we actually have the philosophy, the identity and the, the ambassadors that create a brand. So if you go into the brand book of my, one of my favorite charities is called Charity Water. They have a beautiful little brand book that they create. And you can see their philosophy to bring clean and safe drinking water to people in developing countries. You can see the essence, water changes everything. You can see their identity, Charity Water. They've got a really nice identity and how to use it. And then they've got ambassadors, people who represent that brand. Um, so between the philosophy, the identity and the ambassadors, they're building a brand. Um, Dent has a philosophy, be brave, have fun, make a dent. We want to see a world full of entrepreneurial teams solving meaningful problems. And we have all sorts of interesting entrepreneurs who represent us. So we've got a great brand because we've got philosophy, identity, and ambassadors. So I want you to give yourself a bit of a score. How are you looking for your philosophy, your identity, and ambassadors? The asset that you want to create is actually called a brand Bible or a brand book. Um, and if you don't have a brand book, then you haven't formalized it. So you might have some of these things, but you haven't formalized it into a brand book. That means you don't have the asset. So you haven't, you've, you're almost there. You're so close, but you haven't formalized it into something. Now, once you create a brand book, every single person who works on your brand can easily read the brand book and get it right. They use the right color palette. They use the right logos. They use the philosophy, they use the identity, they understand who are the key people around the business so they can easily understand and represent the brand. Okay, so we've got intellectual property, we've now got a brand. Now we want to develop market assets. So going to market or being ready to build a market is about positioning channels and data. If we wanna build an audience, positioning is important, channels to market are important and data is important. If we cut off any of those three things, we're not going to be able to go to market as powerfully. So positioning, the, the easiest way to have positioning is to win awards, right? Positioning assets are really uh, one of the best ones you can have as awards. If you win an award, that is a positioning asset. 
So for example, uh, two nights ago, won the Scale Up Entrepreneur of the Year Award. So that is pretty powerful positioning. If I'm going to talk about scaling up, if I'm an award-winning entrepreneur who's won awards for scaling up, that puts me out ahead of anyone. It allows me to access more market share than anyone who's not an award-winning scale-up entrepreneur. Um, so winning awards, if you're a Michelin star chef, you're going to be able to access more market than if you're not a Michelin star chef. If you're a multi-award winning business coach, you're going to get more clients than a non-multi-award winning business coach. So positioning assets can be uh, awards. The second thing it can be is that you've got some form of accreditation. The next thing it could be is that you are positioned alongside brands that I already know, like, and respect. If you are the business coach for Google, that means that I'm going to position you higher, right? If you're the... Uh, approved supplier of Microsoft, I'm going to go, oh, okay, that probably means that you're higher up, right? So that's positioning assets. The other one is SEO. If I Google best restaurant in London and your name keeps coming up, that is a positioning asset, right? Um, if I Google the most uh, effective business coach for time management and your name comes up as the top time management coach consistently, that's a positioning asset. So search engine optimization is also a positioning asset. Um, so you want to be able to develop positioning assets. Some of you could win awards in the year ahead. You're just not entering them, right? And you would get yourself a positioning asset if you just won a few awards. Um, the next one is channels. So channels to market can be owned or earned channels to market. So I'll give you an example. Um, Ali Abdal has four and a half million subscribers. That's his channel. I don't have four and a half million subscribers, but Ali wanted to have me on his show. I somehow earned the right to be on his show. So I have an earned channel to market. He has an owned channel to market. He can do whatever he wants with his channel. If he wants to upload music tomorrow, he can upload music. If he wants to upload a, visit, a, a, a video of him singing Twinkle Little Star, he can do it. I have to turn up and play by his rules. It's his channel. He owns it. I have to earn the right to be on it, right? So you can earn the right to be on channels or you can own channels. Um, you can develop a social media following. You can open retail stores, which could be your channels to market. You could launch an app that people have on their phone that could be a channel to market. Um, any of those are channels to market. And then data is where you own your own database. You've got 100,000 people on a database. That's a big channel to market. That's a big ability to get market. So if you've already got a database, if you know more about your market than anybody else, that is also a market asset. Market intelligence is a market asset. So people buy companies all the time because they've got a big database or they've got the right positioning or they've got channels to market. Even if they're pre-revenue, they can have all those things. Um, and they've got some value. And the more assets that you own, the more valuable your business will be. Okay, so we've got intellectual property, we've got a brand, and now we've got a way of going out to the marketplace, positioning channels and data. Now we need products to sell, right? So all of this stuff was pre-revenue. Pre-revenue, we developed our intellectual property, we developed our brand, we got ourselves ready for market. Now, boom, we've got product assets. So we need four product assets. We need a gift, something we can give away for free to capture people's attention. We need a product for prospects, which is an easy first step for doing business with us. We need a core offering, which is the main thing that we do. And we need a product for clients, which is the ongoing journey where we sell something to our existing client base. So we need to have four products in order to be a maximized business. Gift, product for prospects, core offering, product for clients. So if we take something like BMW, right? They've got all this stuff down the gift end and then they've got the product. The core product is the car. And then they've got servicing and finance and insurance for the product for clients. If we take this business, Catherine, uh, Catherine Maslin's business, she's got a free magazine online. She's got uh, a YouTube channel with two minutes to health tips. She's got a book and a 10 day challenge for product for prospects. She's got a core product of health transformation and she's got ongoing subscription services, right? So she's created an entire ecosystem of products. If you take Dent, for example, we give away books and workshops. 
Um, we've got uh, accelerators as our core business, and then we've got ongoing products and services for implementation as our product for clients. Score app, you've got books, you've got podcasts, you've got videos, you've got workshops, then you've got the actual uh, scorecard uh, setup, and then you've got the ongoing subscription. Um, so you've basically got a really nice product ecosystem there. So you're looking at gift, product for prospects, core offering, product for clients. Okay, so now you've got products and services. Now we need some systems. So there's three types of systems that we want. We want marketing and sales systems. We want management and admin systems, and we want operational systems. So marketing and sales generates the demand. Operations generates the supply. And management and admin keeps track of everything. Um, so, for example, one of the most powerful moments in my business was when we launched scorecards and we suddenly had an amazing system for generating demand. People fill in a scorecard, the scorecard goes to the salesperson. Not only that, a scorecard is a product for prospects and it also creates data assets. So suddenly we've got, just by launching a scorecard, we've now got a marketing and sales system. We've got a product for prospects and we've got a data asset so three assets in one suddenly just go boom. They come online with one with one thing. So really, really powerful. The other big breakthrough is when we started de developing portals so that the portal could do a lot of the value of what we do. The portal can do some of the heavy lifting. Amazon gets robots to do heavy lifting. I'm, I'm a big believer in portals doing heavy lifting with your clients. Um, now, many of you could be using AI to generate systems. Some of you don't realize, but you could just plug AI in and the AI would automatically know how to be the system. It could be a chatbot, customer service robot, could be doing all sorts of things for you. It could be massively speeding up the way you edit videos or the way that you manage your team or the way that you generate your marketing. Um, AI has so many systems. And if you're not using AI, you really are going to be losing out to the companies that do use AI in the year ahead. Um, I think you should be plugging AI into your business so that the AI is actually part of your product offering. So what I've been doing is systematically going through all of our service businesses and plugging AI into each service business and spinning out a new AI-enabled platform that is AI plus our intellectual property. So what I'm doing across, we've got a group of companies, what I'm mentally doing is taking the intellectual property for all of our companies, plugging in AI into a portal and having a portal that is intellectual property powered by AI that we're then selling out to market as a low cost subscription. So we're going through the process of doing that with all the businesses that, that we own. Um, and you should do that too. AI enabled portals, AI enabled SaaS is gonna be something that for some of you could give you a life changing amount of money. Once we've got systems assets, we now need to have culture assets. Now here's a thought experiment. Thought experiment, you can, your job, let's say your business is chopping down trees, right? You either can hire a big burly lumberjack with a small ax, or you can get a teenager with a chainsaw. Over the course of, say, a month, who's going to chop down more trees? Probably the teenager with the chainsaw, because the teenager with the chainsaw can just go and down comes the tree, right? The lumberjack is probably going to do the first two or three faster. But once that teenager figures out how to turn on the chainsaw and like just chop it through a tree, they're going to go, oh, wait, this is easy and it doesn't take much energy or effort or focus. I can just do this thing. It's very hard to be a lumberjack and stay that much energy, effort and focus consistently. Think about it like a sales team. If you have the best salespeople, but they don't have brochures, they don't have websites, they don't have awards, they don't have data, they don't have product for prospects, they don't have any of that stuff, they're going to have struggle. They've got to use every ounce of focus to make that sale as opposed to if you've got all these things for them, it's like they just get to use the chainsaw. Um, so your job as a business is to give your people chainsaws, right? To make sure that it's super easy for them to go do that, do that thing that you want them to do. Um, now, culture assets are not your people. The culture assets are not your people. The culture assets are the things that attract your people. Right? It's the reason people want to work with you. So for example, your onboarding process is a culture asset. Your pay structure and bonus structure is a culture asset. The, uh, the, the way that you treat people on their 12-month anniversary, two-year anniversary, three-year anniversary is a culture asset. Um, 
the videos that tell people what it's like to work at your company is a culture asset. Some people create culture assets that are like a culture Bible for their business or a culture uh, guide for their business. And it tells you our vision, our mission, our values. This is what it's like working here. Um, some people, the way you advertise the role and the way you describe the business that you're working with, sometimes the vision, the mission, the values of the organization is all part of the culture assets. So the culture assets are not your people. The culture assets are the things that you will see around the people that make the people want to work there. So it's the way you run meetings and the way that you, the little things that you say, right? The the maxims, right? It's the uh, high standards that you require of people. It's the people who you put into roles of leadership and how they got there. Um, so all of these things. So for example, having a core values poster is a culture asset. Having a really clear team um, accountabilities and roles descriptions is a culture asset where you can click on everyone and see what it is that they do. These are good culture assets. Um, having an onboarding document, right? All really good culture assets. So there's four that you need. You need culture assets that attract key people of influence, marketing and sales people, management and admin people and operations people because they all are attracted to different things. You know, you might get a company that attracts amazing engineers but doesn't attract any good salespeople. That's because you've got great culture assets for engineers, but not great culture assets for salespeople. And the final one is funding assets. Funding assets attract investors or lenders. And that's your documents, your investor documents, the way that you interact with your stakeholders, the valuation of the business and the business plan, All right? So all of those things are the things that um, look like funding assets. If you look at publicly listed companies, they have monthly and quarterly filings for, sorry, quarterly filings that tell you exactly how the business is running. Small businesses that attract funding, they have a similar sort of thing. They have a, a way of documenting how their business is going. They conduct regular valuations. So a public company has a minute by minute valuation, but there are plenty of small businesses that do a quarterly valuation or an annual valuation. Um, there are small businesses that write a letter to shareholders every quarter or every six months, or they at least do a director's report every six months so that whoever buys the business in three years can look back through the director's reports and see what was being said. So there's a way of structuring all of this stuff. I've got this cheat sheet that I, I use uh, for putting in place, you know, board of directors and chairperson funding and business plan and like all of that sort of stuff. Um, too, too much to go through in one session, but you get the idea. Funding assets, right? The more funding assets, the more funding you'll get. Um, I can't stress this enough. I, I really find it frustrating that at the moment there's this whole conversation about how funding is some sort of like a human right that every entrepreneur is entitled to. It's like investors don't have any obligation to invest in your business. You've got to give them the assets that they need for them to want to invest in your business. Right? You can't guilt people into investing into your business. They've got to be fighting with each other to invest into your business. They, they need to feel special that they got chosen to invest into your business. Um, so there you have it. This is where we put everything together. And essentially, this is what a business is. It's intellectual property, brand, market, product, systems, culture, and funding. And you can turn all of these into assets and then the business will scale. So once you've got all of those, you start adding people to the equation and those people start becoming high performers and those high performers generate scalable revenues. So that's the scalable business. Now, what you do is you look at your business and you have to be honest and say, am I struggling? Am I getting by? Am I really proud of this? And you go through piece by piece and you evaluate which ones that you've got. The payoff for this is huge. In London, if you buy a million pound property, it'll pay you about 30,000 pounds a year, maybe 35,000 pounds a year. So for a million pound outlay, you get 35,000 a year. For most of you, if you spent 35,000 on developing assets in your business, you'd probably get an extra million, right? It would be inverted. It would be the it would be a complete flip, right? If you actually knew how to develop, develop and deploy uh, assets, you'd be able to create digital assets that create a lot more scale if you if you know how to shop and if you know how to create these things. You know, the real wealth at the moment is being made by people who know how to develop business assets. Property is, everything's already priced into the plan with property. Property is a great place to park money. I park money in property. 
Um, it's fabulous once you've made money to stick it into property and just let it sit there, um, you know, as a long, long term, you know, for the kids type strategy. Um, same as the stock market, but those things are already priced in. Microsoft is worth what it's worth. Um, Google is worth what it's worth, right? It's priced into the equation. But the opportunity to create wealth is the uh, is the opportunity for entrepreneurs to build an ecosystem of assets and then sell that ecosystem, right? So you build an ecosystem of assets, you ramp up the revenue, and then you sell it for a life-changing amount of money if you want to. Or you own it and it produces income regardless of where you are in the world. Now, if it was easy, everyone would do it, right? If it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. It's kind of like, you know, if you talk to a bodybuilder, it's simple to be a to, to be a bodybuilder, but it's not easy. It's simple to be an entrepreneur, but it's not easy. There's 24 assets. You've got to develop all of them. You've got to be a key person of influence. You've got to develop a good team, all of those sorts of things. But if it was easy, everyone would do it. And if everyone was doing it, it would cease to be valuable. So keep that in mind. If it was easy, everyone would do it. If everyone was doing it, it wouldn't be valuable anymore. So there's a lot there. Most of you are going to be feeling overwhelmed. You're going to be sitting there going, whoa, okay, I didn't expect to be dumped 24 different things on my to-do list plus build a team, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's fair enough. But at least now you've got the re the reality of what uh, what creating the, 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 uh, the business is going to look like. 